Pan by Bruno Schultz In a corner between the backs of sheds and outbuildings was a blind alley leading from the courtyard, the farthest ultimate cul-de-sac, hemmed in between the privy and the wall of the chicken run, a dismal spot beyond which one could see no farther. This was the land's end, the Gibraltar of the courtyard, desperately knocking its head against the blind fence of horizontal planks, enclosing that little world with finality. From under the fence ran a rivulet of black, stinking water, a vein of rotting greasy mud which never dried out, the only road which led across the border of the fence into the wider world. The despair of the fetid alleyway had pushed for so long against the obstacle of the fence that it had loosened one of its planks. We boys did the rest and pried the plank free. In this way we made a breach, opening a window to the sun. Putting a foot on the plank which we had thrown as a bridge across the puddle, the prisoner of the courtyard could squeeze through the crack and let himself out into a new, wider world of fresh breezes. There, spread out before him, was a large, overgrown garden. Tall pear trees, broad apple trees, grew there in profusion, covered with silvery rustling leaves, with a foaming white glinting net. Thick tangled grass, never cut, covered the undulating ground with a fluffy carpet. Common meadow grasses with feathery heads grew there, wild parsley with its delicate filigrees, ground ivy with rough wrinkled leaves, and dead nettles smelling of mint. Shiny, sinewy plantains spotted with rust shot up to display bunches of thick red seeds. The whole of this jungle was soaked in the gentle air and filled with blue breezes. When you lay in the grass, you were under the azure map of clouds and sailing continents. You inhaled the whole geography of the sky. From that communion with the air, the leaves and blades became covered with delicate hair, with a soft layer of down. A rough bristle of hooks made, it seemed, to grasp and hold the waves of oxygen. That delicate and whitish layer related the vegetation to the atmosphere, gave it the silvery grayish tint of the air, of shadowy silences between two glimpses of the sun. And one of the plants, yellow, inflated with air, its pale stems full of milky juice, brought forth from its empty shoots only pure air, pure down in the shape of fluffy dandelion balls scattered by the wind to dissolve noiselessly into the blue silence. The garden was vast with a number of extensions and had various zones and climates. From one side it was open to the sky and air, and there it offered the softest, most delicate bed of fluffy green. But where the ground extended into a low-lying isthmus and dropped into the shadow of the back wall of a deserted soda factory, it became grimmer, overgrown and wild with neglect, untidy, fierce with thistles, bristling with nettles, covered with a rash of weeds until, at the very end between the walls, in an open rectangular bay, it lost all moderation and became insane. There it was an orchard no more, but a paroxysm of madness, an outbreak of fury, of cynical shamelessness and lust. There, bestially liberated, giving full rein to their passion, ruled the empty, overgrown cabbage heads of burrs, enormous witches, shedding their voluminous skirts in broad daylight, throwing them down one by one until their swollen, rustling, hole-riddled rags bury the whole quarrelsome bastard breed under their crazy expanse. And still the skirts swelled and pushed, piled up one on top of another, spreading and growing all the time, a mass of tinny leaves reaching up to the low eaves of a shed. It was there that I saw him first and for the only time in my life, at a noon hour crazy with heat. It was at a moment when time, demented and wild, breaks away from the treadmill of events and like an escaping vagabond runs shouting across the fields. Then the summer grows out of control, spreads at all points and all over space with a wild impetus, doubling and trebling itself into an unknown lunatic dimension. 
At that hour, I submitted to the frenzy of chasing butterflies, to the passion of pursuing these shimmering spots, these errant white flakes, trembling in awkward zigzags in the burning air. And it so happened that one of these spots of light divided during flight into two, then into three, and the shining, blindingly white triangle of spots led me, like a will-o'-the-wisp, through the jungle of thistles, scorched by the sun. I stopped at the edge of the burrs, not daring to advance into that hollow abyss. And then, suddenly, I saw him. Submerged up to his armpits in the thicket of burrs, he crouched in front of me. I saw his broad back and a dirty shirt and the grubby side of his jacket. He sat there, as if ready to leap, his shoulders hunched as under a great burden. His body panted with tension, and perspiration streamed down his copper-brown face, glinting in the sun. Immobile, he seemed to be working very hard, struggling under some enormous weight. I stood, nailed to the spot by his look, held captive by it. It was the face of a tramp or a drunkard. A tuft of filthy hair bristled over his broad forehead, rounded like a stone washed by a stream. That forehead was now creased into deep furrows. I did not know whether it was the pain, the burning heat of the sun, or that superhuman effort that had eaten into his face and stretched those features near to cracking. His dark eyes bored into me with the fixedness of supreme despair or of suffering. He both looked at me and did not. He saw me and did not see. His eyes were like bursting shells, strained in a transport of pain or the wild delights of inspiration. And suddenly on those taut features there slowly spread a terrible grimace. The grimace intensified, taking in the previous madness and tension, swelling, becoming broader and broader, until it broke into a roaring, hoarse shout of laughter. Deeply shaken, I saw how, still roaring with laughter, he slowly lifted himself up from his crouching position and, hunched like a gorilla, his hands in the torn pockets of his ragged trousers, began to run, cutting in great leaps and bounds through the rustling tinfoil of the burrs, a pan without a pipe, retreating in flight to his familiar haunts.